Good morning, everybody. I'm Nikolai Palok. I'm a Java developer advocate at Oracle. And today is going to be you, me, and modern Java in action. We're going to take a bunch of new Java features. And we're going to see how what they look like uh, when you put them into an IDE. Uh, we will implement a, a small GitHub crawler. I'll, come, I'll explain later a bit what exactly it does. We'll aggressively use, misuse, overuse, and abuse new Java features. So this is not meant as, this is what I'm going to do in production with my teams. I'm go with my team, I'm going to um, expose them to all of these kind of neat tricks. I just want to show you what it looks like, and then you can decide which of those things look good to you and which don't, what you want to follow up on. I cannot go into detail on pretty much any of these features, because that would take way too much time. Uh, we have done, uh, with, with my colleague Anna, who sits there, we've done uh, a three-hour deep dive at another conference that was uh, um, earlier, b earlier before this talk. And so basically, you need all these three hours to go into all these details and all these features. So if there's a feature that you don't know yet and you don't quite get what exactly is happening, that's perfectly fine, right? Follow up later, preferably on the Java YouTube channel, where we uh, give explanations for all of this in ample detail. If you want to check out the code, it's on my GitHub. And the slides are online as well, although they're super minimal, so I don't think there's a sort of point to get there. And you can ask questions anytime. If I make a mistake and you feel like you can fix it, you can also say that you can just yell. You don't need to wait for me to take a pause and you know lift your hand. Just, like, just yell at me if you think uh, you have something to add or want to ask something. We're not going to have time for questions at the, uh, at the end of the talk. Um, I will be around uh, until lunch, unfortunately, only. I have to leave then. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, come here after the talk or find me down there somewhere um, and talk to me anytime. Like I love to talk about this kind of stuff. Even if I'm in the middle of lunch, just come up and ask. I love to answer your questions. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to write a little GitHub crawler that connects to a URL, which is hopefully a GitHub URL, tries to identify whether it's a pull request page, an issue page, or some other kind of page, looks for the interesting section, not the header, not the footer, just the part where the issue conversation, for example, happens, finds outgoing links, and feeds all of those links back into step one. If it finds a link that goes to an external page like Wikipedia, it stops, and if there's an error, uh, it stops there as well. Then it will print some statistics, so like very minor numbers, like how many pages did I find. We'll create a nice, a nice page list, and hopefully we'll get around to showing this as a website on localhost as well. The game plan is for the domain model to use records and sealed interfaces and to operate on them with pattern matching. We're going to fetch the pages with the HTTP client that was added in JDK 11. So I used to say the new HTTP client, but given that it's like six years old now, I dropped the new. It's just the HTTP client now. And we're going to use virtual threads via structure concurrency um, to access those pages in parallel. We're going to present the results with text blocks. We're hopefully going to get around to string templates. We're going to host them with a simple file server locally. And we're just going to have modules because modules are good. Uh, and with that, let's get started. So uh, what we have here is, uh, by the way, I have like this kind of like precarious setup. So uh, forgive me if uh, everything takes a, a second longer. Uh, we have a super simple code base at the moment that just has this main class that doesn't do anything. Let's start with creating uh, the domain types. Um, I earlier described what kind of pages we have. Let's create a record for uh, some of these pages. So let's start in a page package with, let's say, um, let's start with external page. That's a simple one. External page. Um, we're going to make that a record. What does an external page have? Uh, it has a URL. And uh, if uh, it has some content of the page that was picked up. Now, we could be done here. It's a record. We don't need to write more, but I want to write more. What I want to do specifically is put uh, at a con compact constructor that does a few checks that make sure that the state that this object is being instantiated in is correct and doesn't, uh, like, it's, it's not wonky, right? Like, it has, should be non-null URI, should have a non-null content. Uh, it should also have a non-empty content. So let's make sure that's as well. Um, that's the case as well. If the content uh, is blank, we're going to throw a new new argument exception, you know, put some put a good message here. And uh, that kind of stuff. And we get accessors, we get equals, we get a hash code, and all of those will use all of these uh, components by default. But looking at this, you could think, wait, doesn't the U in URL stand for unique? Couldn't I use that for equals? And yeah, we could. So let's overwrite equals as it is. Uh, let's just use the URL for that. Yes, and we're going to rewrite this equals implementation because we can do it better. Um, so let's do a little bit of a trick. Let's do the this equals o, the this equals o check first. You know, it's kind of like a habit to put that there. 
And now what we can do is well, we can start using pattern matching. We can say, okay, uh, or like type pattern specifically. Um, if this is not the other, what else could it be? It could maybe it's also an instance of a page. And then, oh, sorry, of, of an external page, of course. Oop, that was not intended of an external page. And if that's the case, then we can just um, do the um, equals comparison objects equals of my URL with uh, the page URL. Right? Uh, so this is a type pattern uh, that I'm using here and that allows us to write much more elegant equals methods. It's not the main goal, of course, but it's kind of nice. Let's create one more type. Uh, let's create the GitHub uh, pull request page. Oh, uh, it's also supposed to be a record. Now, what does a pull request page have? Uh, it also uh, has a URL. It also has content. But what it does beyond that is because for GitHub pages, we do want to track which other pages it links to. It needs to know a bunch of links. And those links, we're going to, for now, we're going to change it later, save um, as a set of URIs. And uh, it also has a pull request number, right? PR number. There we go. OK. So again, what we should do is we should have a compact constructor that verifies this. I'm going to not put the verification here, but I want to do something else here. So usually, uh, records should be seen as a carrier for immutable data. Now, the URL is immutable. The, s the content is immutable. The issue number, uh, sorry, the pull request number being an int is immutable. All the fields backing that are final. But the set is not necessarily immutable. Somebody could give me a hash set. And I assign that hash set, uh, the, the, the record assigns that hash set to this field, and then it hands out a hash set. Somebody could call clear on that. I don't want that. So what you would usually want to do is you want to make sure that um, if you get any collection, any kind of, kind of mutable object, that you create immutable versions of it, or at least a local copy. So set.copy of gives me an immutable copy. Um, and if it's already immutable, what comes in, it's not going to create another copy. So that's kind of nice. And what I can do now as well, I already know that I need that later. I'm going to create another constructor, right? Because records don't require me to write a lot of code, but they do allow me to customize them pretty much, um, not, not any way I want. Uh, they have some limitations intentionally, but uh, they give me a lot of freedom. So what I can do is I, can, I want to add a constructor that does not use, well, let's see whether I can use the mouse. Yes. Um, that does not use uh, the links, because the link set is still empty. And so, yeah, um, IntelliJ already put the set dot off here. In the past version, you used to put null here, which is terrible. Uh, never pass null for a collection, use an empty collection. So yeah, and I can also overwrite equals and hash code here as well, but I'm going to skip that. There's also the GitHub issue page I'm not going to bother you with. There's an error page which just contains the exception that was thrown during resolution. Uh, let's check that out. Um, so in case I made any mistakes, I just threw anything or everything away that I coded. And um, these are the four types we have now. So, for example, this is what the error page looks like. It also contains a URL, but it contains an exception, because apparently there was an exception when connecting to it. Now, what we've done now is we've modeled the data very closely. We know what kinds of pages we have, and we specifically created types for them. But these types are all unrelated, and there's an additional connection between them that we didn't get around to. And that is, if you look at those types, you're seeing that there seems to be some either-or going on. Either I have an error page, or I have one of the other ones. I could go further and say, well, either I have something that is on GitHub or I have something external. And we can express, and we should express that as well in data-oriented programming. Um, so let's use uh, sealed interface to do just that. Let's start with a page interface. Um, we're going to make it sealed. And we're going to permit as subtypes, if I have a page, it either was a successful connection or a failed connection. So let's do that. Let's say it's a successful page or a all oh, right, uh, I'm not great at typing, so I will make a lot of typos. Uh, please excuse me. Uh, or oh, it's an error page. And you all, you all pages have a URL, right? So we can start defining a little bit of a contract here. All pages have a URL. OK, so successful page doesn't exist. Let's keep going there. Let's create an interface successful page. I'm going to make that sealed as well. It's going to permit, um, let's think, successful connection is either to an external page or it's to a GitHub page. Let's do that. Let's say external page or GitHub page. And we go through the same again. Oh, right. Oh, this also does have a, contact, a contract because if we successfully connect it, we know it has content. OK, now let's create a GitHub page as well. Another interface. Oop, that was sealed interface. 
And what does this permit? It's either an issue page or a pull request page. We're going to ignore the fact that GitHub actually does have more pages uh, for now. We don't need to put that here now. Now, um, there's a bunch of compilers that we're going to clean up now. Uh, let's start with, for example, the fact that this error page does not yet implement that interface. Clearly, we need to do that, right? So we need to add implements page here. That's great. IntelliJ just did that for us. The same is true for external page. Yes, make that implement that. That's also good. Um, same is true for these two. And now that we have this extraction of page, there's something that we can now express much better. And that is this. The GitHub pull request page has a bunch of links. And those links are currently stored as URIs. But in the process of fetching all these pages, we want to actually resolve those URIs. And we want to you know, resolve each URI to a page object. And so we want each page to know the outgoing links also as pages. So let's do that. Now we have this extraction. We can use it here. Um, I'm kind of lucky that I didn't have to put the types in the, in the constructor here because I'm using a compact constructor. That means I don't have to change anything else, just the, uh, the component list up there. And now we can s have this here as kind of, oh, extends. That's why it's red. Okay. Uh, we can also define a contract here, namely that each GitHub or pull request page, because, uh, sorry, each GitHub page, because only those are the ones where we resolve more links, has a set of pages. Uh, that are this link, these links. And what we can do here as well, and I'm going to copy paste that, we're going to use it later, is a sub subtree method. So what does it do? Let's, I'm going to copy paste and I'm going to quickly walk over it. Uh, oh, there's a ton of types to import, of course. It's going to happen a few times. Okay. So subtree just, first of all, we treat this as, tr as a tree. If you know your computer science, you know that this is not a tree, it's a general graph, but we're going to treat it as a tree with back references. If you don't know exactly what the, any of that means, doesn't matter, ignore it, it's fine. We're going to treat uh, each page as a root of its own little subtree, and what I want to do here is I want to stream over that. I want to be able to say, okay, given this port in the part in the tree, give me just all the children and, and all the ancestors, and we're going to stream over all of that. And the way I'd implemented this is kind of like lame. I basically built up a list that contains all of these, all of these pages and then return it. But I want to point out a few nice things that I'm, that I'm using here, which is sequence collections, um, which were added in uh, JDK 21. So for example, I'm using a method here that's called remove first that did not exist on sets or lists before. I'm also using reversed here, which is pretty cool. This gives me um, the original collection but in a, a view on it that iterates in the reverse order. Uh, remove first and reverse here are not necessary. It just means that the encounter order that I get is kind of similar to what you would expect if you look at the tree. I just want to point out that there are new interfaces and methods in the collection framework that you want to check out. Uh, sequence collections, do look into that. They're extremely helpful uh, in these situations where you want to reverse, for example, um, a list. Okay, if I'm not mistaking, that was it already for this section. Yes, so this is the kind of types we have now. Let's repeat the trick from earlier and throw everything where I just wrote and replace it with the correct version in case I made any mistakes. Um, so this is the, the infrastructure we have now. We still can't do anything with it um, because what we're lacking is the actual code that connects to GitHub. I checked that out now and we need to fix it. There's a lot of moving parts in here that are already implemented because they are boring. I only want to show you the good parts. So what we have here is a bunch of code with like compile errors that we now need to fix over time. So let's do that. First, let's start with this page with links type here that is undefined. I want to create a record page with links. What is this about? In the process of resolving a URI, I'm finding, oh, this is a GitHub page. So I can process it, I can find everything. But what I need to do then is, I need to have a mutable data structure that I can start while I go through the content of the GitHub page to put in all the URIs, right? And then later I can resolve all of those URIs themselves, and then I can create the final page which has, which has an immutable um, set of pages it links to. So that means that I need a, a mutable data structure at least for a while. What I need here is not an important type. It's not like unlike uh, GitHub page or the external page records that were kind of essential to the domain I was modeling, this is just an ad hoc type. I just need it for like a little bit. But records are great for that as well, right? So I can just say, okay, I, what I need here is something that's a page uh, and it comes with, oh, let's import that type, and it comes uh, with a set of URIs. I think links is the correct name. 
And you know, you could add more here. I think specifically, again, I need a constructor that doesn't have a link set yet. So um, let's add that one. Good. This is this one, that, so it doesn't have a links set yet. I also mentioned before that I really want to make sure that the set is, usually I want to make these collections immutable. But in this case, I do want to mutate it. I do want to add stuff. And that's okay. It's not like that's disallowed. Records, the language allows this. And also Brian Goetz even allows this. Just make it an intentional move, right? By default, everything should be immutable in a record. Make it a conscious decision to make something mutable if you need it. And I do. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that the links is always... Um, a hash set, so it's always a mutable set. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating an ad hoc type that I just need locally. Really, it could just be contained to this class, actually. It could just be an inner class here. It just happens to be the case that I need it in a different type here as well. I need it in two types, so that's why I made it package local. But this will happen frequently. You can even create, did you, by the way, did you know this? Did you know that you can create a class here? This is not new. You could always do this. I'm not sure whether you should, but you can. So what I'm saying is like, if you need a local type, create a local type. Records are super easy for that. Just create a record that says, oh yeah, I just need a foo uh, that contains a string that's called bar. Just, yeah, if you need this, go ahead and do it. Maybe not method local, maybe you want to put it into the class, um, but you do create local types if you need them. It's better to use a local record than to abuse something like map entry, who's ever needed a pair and abused a map entry even though there was no map around. Yes, great. Please now you write a small little record that actually says what it's about. Uh, then no generics probably involved with ultra helps out a bit. So that's good. Okay. Um, this class has a bunch of compile errors uh, in the imports, which is kind of weird. Where do they come from? Oh, damn it. So, so um, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that the HTML that I parse, I looked through how to do this. And I later in the project ended up using JSOUP. I should have just used JSOUP from the beginning. I was like, no, I want to do this with onboard stuff. And it turns out Swing actually has something like that. <laughs> so I'm using Swing here to parse through the URL that I get back from GitHub to find all the, uh, to find all the URLs. But the imports are red. Who has an idea why the imports could be red? Yes, exactly. If something goes wrong, it's probably the model system's at fault. Um, right, so I said earlier I wanted to use modules. So I need to declare dependencies, right? So let's require Java Desktop. There's that, um, and that fixes all of these. Now let's see, there should be some uh, to-dos here that are left, though, though those are not to-dos for us. Okay, no, maybe we're done already. Okay, let's have a look at the page tree factory. Right, so first of all, again, we also have um, a few compile errors here because we're already using the HTTP, or we're already declaring the HTTP client. So let's work with the HTTP client a bit. First of all, um, it lives in this little module, requires Java net HTTP. So that fixes those imports. And let's go um, to a place where we're using that. Let's say, where is it? Fetch page as string. Okay. So what's the task here? We get a URL. And what we need to do is we need to return a string that is just the, the page content, right? Just the HTML as a string. That's what we need to do here. And we want to do that with the HTTP client that was added in JDK um, 11. So we have a field here that is this client. It's unused still. Let's actually create that client first. So, you know, you see the page tree factory needs it in its constructor. This is as good a time as any to actually start writing some code that does something. So let's start with, we want to create a new page tree factory. And we need an HTTP client here. Let's just write, well, let's just write client here for now. Okay, I mean, it's not defined, right? We need to define this. Okay, so how do you get an HTTP uh, client? The new API is pretty cool. It builds a lot on immutability so that you can share these things between different threads, for example. So the HTTP client is immutable. That means you need a builder to create it. If you get a new HTTP client builder, you will see that you can configure all kinds of stuff. Authenticators, cookie handlers, connect timeouts. You can, um, connection timeouts, you can put all those here, and then you can overwrite them in individual instances when you make a request. It turns out we need to set none of these. We need just call new builder build, or better yet, we can just say new HTTP client. Okay, so that was simple. Now we got our client. Um, let's use it in the page tree factory. So we got the client. Now how do we make a request? It's the same 
it's the same uh, approach. You create immutable requests that you could reuse if you wanted to, which is kind of neat, um, and uh, you go to that true builder. So let's go HTTP request, oops, request, new builder. We want to connect to this URL. I want to do a get. I don't need to put the get here. It is the default, if I remember, remember correctly. Oh yeah, it says there, this is the default. I still kind of like to see it there. You know, your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary. Uh, so this is the request. And now we just say client dot send the request. We're not quite done yet. I'm going to get back to the remaining compiler error in a second. Note that this is a blocking call, right? The method throws interrupted exception, which is an indicator that it sits in the send and waits until the response comes back. So I already alluded to earlier that we want to request these pages in parallel. We are getting into that space now. Um, this is a blocking request if you do not have virtual threads, and if you do want to scale an application up, this is not good, because this means you now captured a platform thread that sits there and waits for something to happen over the network, which is basically forever from the view of a CPU. But we're going to keep going, because we will use virtual threads in a second. Uh, if we send a request, we also need to explain how to um, handle the body of the response. We're going to use a body handler for that, that's what it's called, and a body handler of string just gets the response and turns into a string. So now if we get the body, we actually do have the string. So let's return that. And then let's wonder why we got... Oh, right, uh, I didn't call build on this. Right. Okay. Now let's do this here. Um, let's let, this, is the, this is the big virtual threads slash uh, um, structure and currency part of the, of the presentation. And it's not actually that huge. Because, you know, in regular development life, we don't create a ton of threads, you know, day in, day out. Usually we have some framework doing it for us, or maybe we have an executor service that we commit something to. And this is very similar, right? So using virtual threads is unlike lambdas, it's not an intrusive change. It's not going to mean that you're going to go through your entire code base and you see plenty of opportunities to now use virtual threads here, here, and there. If you already have an, an app that uses blocking code throughout, there's a good chance you just switch, uh, turn a switch somewhere that says use virtual threads now. Could be a new web framework, for example. And then things just keep working. So it's not like you have to do this all over the place. What I'm going to use here is going a little bit beyond virtual threads. I'm going to use structured concurrency. Uh, I'm going to show the advantage of this um, later when, when, every, when all this work, uh, comp when all this code compiles and runs. OK, so what we're going to do now is we're going we're to get a set of links and want to request all of those links at the same time. That's the simple task, right? And the way we're going to do this, basically, what we want to do is we're going to say links. Uh, give me a stream, and then we want to map that, and then we basically want to say link, and now, I don't know, fetch link blockingly. Something like that, right? That's basically what we want to do. And structure task scope allows us to write, write pretty much that code with a little bit around it. So um, let's start with a try with resources block. It's a new structure task scope scope shutdown on failure. We're defining what should happen if any of these tasks fail. If any of these tasks fail, just shut everything down. Um, that's, that's the policy I'm going with here. OK, now we take our links. Uh, we stream them, we map them, and now we need to do something slightly different, of course. So for each link that we get, we go to the scope. And now we're nesting lambdas. Um, just bear with me. We take the, scorp, uh, the scope, fork a new task, and the new task that is forked, is gonna uh, fetch page, I, oh wait, uh, create page, what's the, yeah, create page, that's the, um, that's the method we want to call. And we want to give it a link and the depth. Uh, we're carrying the depth with us because at some point we're going to reduce the depth to depth minus one to make sure that we don't crawl all of GitHub. The depth is just meant to keep track of how deep into this research we are, so it's not essential. Really what we're going to do is, for each link, fork a new task. OK, now we're going to collect all of those into a list. There we go. Those will be our future pages, the subtasks. Uh, we can actually, for once, not use var. Um, let's put this here. This is what we get. We get a list of subtasks that will, each of them will produce a page. So we could maybe re um, rename this to page tasks. This is the first step in using structured concurrency, S forking all the tasks. Second step is, to wait. Uh, we just wait for everything to be done. 
Again, we hopefully are in a virtual thread, so we don't care that this blocks. And then uh, we're going to throw if it failed. That's an important part. Uh, what happens if any of these failed? You want to throw an exception. Let's add a catch clause. And remember that error page that I mentioned earlier? So what should have happened if any, if any of these create page calls, if anything goes wrong internally, they should have created an error page instance. They should never throw an exception. So this should never happen. We should never get an execution exception here. So if this happened, it's a legal state, something is wrong. Um, this should have been caught by error page minus typos. Okay. That's the second step, joining and handling the errors. Third step, get your results. So that's simple. Um, we're going to get the page tasks, stream. Uh, we're going to take subtask get, call subtask get to get the content out. And then we're just going to turn that into a set. And there we go. And that was <coughs> pretty much all the virtual thread and structured concurrency we want to do for now. Although I'm going to come back to it in a second when the code compiles uh, to show you something, uh, something really cool that you can do with this. Okay, so that's that. Let's see what other compiled errors we have. Okay, so uh, we're switching gears back to, um, to, to, to pattern matching and records a bit. This is a little bit, at this point, th this is a little bit unclear what exactly needs to happen here. So I wrote it there in to do. We have a page that we got here. This is the page that was already resolved. We already know what the, what the URL is, what the content is. If it's a GitHub page, we know what the pull request number is um, or the issue number. We know all of that. But the page instance here, that's up here, still has an empty set of links because we just resolved those. We just only now resolved, or we don't, sorry, we're now going to resolve those links. So what we need to do is we need to say, if this is an external page, we don't care about the links. If this is an error page, we don't care about the links. But if it is a GitHub pull request or issue page, please now resolve all of, the, all of those links and then add that information, information to that record. Now, we cannot add the information to the record instance that we have, right? They're all immutable. We cannot set anything new here. So what we need to do is we need to create a copy that is exactly the same as before, just has this one field changed. And at the moment, that's still kind of cumbersome. That will become easier in the future in Java, um, but at the moment, it's not. So what we need to do is we need to say, OK, um, we want to switch over the page here. And the two easy cases are if it's an external page or if it's an error page. And if you don't know what the underscore is doing here, search for unnamed patterns uh, on YouTube or on the JEP list. Um, that's really cool stuff. Then we just return the page as is. Right? We don't care about that. The interesting part is, and we see, we see we get a compile error because we didn't yet cover all possible pages. There are two more. Let's start with the GitHub issue page, uh, pull request page. In case it's that, what we want to do is we want to return a new GitHub pull request page that has the same URL as the old one, that has the same content as the old one, this, I'm going to put something here in a second, and that has the same pull request number as the old one. Here is where the links go. So we're going to um, resolve the links of uh, its page with links dot links, and here we go depth minus one to make sure we don't uh, recurse internally. Okay. This is nasty, right? I just wrote a long line of code to basically say, create a copy of the record with this one change. And with expressions, um, and I just forgot the technical term that is now proposed in the, in the JEP, will make this easier. But for now, we would have to do this. And you will do this kind of frequently, because if you have a record and everything is immutable, that's the only way to create a new instance of it that is a copy. You can create methods on those records, but I would recommend to just wait until this new feature arrives. Um, let's now also do this with the issue, but I want to use a different approach here that you can also use because we can also just destructure it. Didn't just IntelliJ just propose this? Oh, there we go. Okay, so what we can do here is um, we can just take apart the record immediately. So here we said if it's a pull request page, give me you know an instance or give me that instance cast to that type. What we're doing here is we're saying if it's an issue page, just take it apart into all of its pieces. We don't need this piece though, so let's replace it with underscore so it's more readable. And then we do this. Again, for copying this, it's, it's, it's still terrible. Well, terrible, but still not good. But this will 
other cases, this will come in very handy when you can say on the left hand side, this is what I care about. In case it's this type, I care about these parts of it, take them out, and then the right hand side just does the processing. Okay, we still have a compile error here somewhere. There's a semicolon missing. And that might already work. Let's see. Uh, so I have the page tree factory here. Um, sure. And then we create the page for what was passed in. So this is just the stuff that um, that I pass as command line arguments. By the way, for these command line arguments, I again use a little record that parses them. The parsing is oversimplified. It really breaks on pretty much any any little mistake I might make. But it's still nice to capture all the command line arguments, for example, in this uh, little record here. Then I create uh, the page. And then let's just print the page. OK. Let's see whether this does its thing. Oh, it's already running. That's weird. Let's see what we get. Resolving. Now let's bet on conference Wi-Fi. Works great. OK, these are all kind of log messages. We can entirely ignore what they say. Um, it's just to see that something is happening. And now at some point, hopefully, we should see some output. OK, that doesn't look good. OK, maybe the demo gods are bit us on the next run. I want to show you something else. Um, Namely, I want to show you a feature of structured concurrency. What we just did is basically we spawned a new thread for each page, right? And then for each page, we started, again, a new thread for each of its, of its children. And the cool thing about this, this creates a tree, right? A tree of threads where we start at the top with the first page. And then, you know, we got a bunch of threads that create for those links. And then they block where those links are resolved and so on. So this creates this huge tree of tasks. And if you have a highly concurrent application that does a few non-trivial things, it's probably not as recursive as this, but you can see how this will also be happening, right? You have a task that spawns these other three things and they maybe need to reach out as well. And the exceptionally cool thing about virtual threads and structured concurrency specifically is if you use it with a structured task scope, is that this structure does not disappear. It is visible at runtime. And to demonstrate that, um, I need to quickly see which number that was. I have some notes here. Uh, there was issue number 740, just as an example. So I'm picking here. I'm just creating a breakpoint that we'll uh, pause on if the issue number um, is 740. Okay. And then I need to go to my readme to copy some, uh, some code, this here, oh, with that one as well. Um, that gives us a helpful little message. And that message tells us how to create a thread dump. So we're now running the same code again, and we're going to wait in that. Um, the second I kick in the click in here, it's probably going to start running. I'm going to call this command here. OK, so that's the command I want to run. Now, we now we're blocked in that breakpoint. I need to set the breakpoint, because otherwise, if the connection is fast, we're just going to run through the entire prob program before I get around to copy pasting this. So OK, so let's fire off this command. Because we're waiting in a breakpoint, it can't actually compete, uh, complete. Uh, so let's take out this breakpoint and let's continue. OK. So I use J command. Ignore the double J. That's an uh, error on the, term on, the guitar, uh, on, the, on the IntelliJ terminal. I asked it to create a thread dump in a, in a JSON format. And that would be this threads.json file here. OK, so this is just the thread dump in the form of a JSON. There's a ton of information about what each thread does in here, right? So you can see, for example, there's a stack here. There's another stack there. There's lots of stacks, right? That's what every thread is currently doing. But the interesting thing is that there's a new field called owner. And this owner refers to the thread ID of another thread. So if you look at any of these, so let's pick something that maybe is doing something interesting, this one, for example, you can see that this one is currently doing something HTTP related, right? It's getting an INET address, something like that, right? So it's busy doing a task that we gave it. OK, so let's say we have a bug here. We put a breakpoint, we follow up the stack, we try to figure out what's going on, and then we end here, right? Who has ever ended their debugging session in a call from like executor service, which has to just go or run, and then you're wondering, what do I do now? I can tell you what you can do now. now you can go to the owner thread. And if you look this up now, which I'm not gonna, you will see that the owner thread is sitting in that structure task scope waiting for this task to be done. So if once IDEs support this, 
you can jump from one thread to the parent thread and then see what that context is. And if that doesn't help you, you can jump to that parent and see what that context is. So this allows you, just like a, good, like a debugger allows you to jump between stack frames, this will allow you to jump between related threads. Not all threads are related. Threads are only related if they, if they are created and destroyed at certain times. This is what structured pro concurrency provides. Um, you maybe want to look into that if you're, um, if you're interested in that. Okay, I'm fast running out of time. I prefer instead of hasting through the text block portion, what I want to prefer is I want to show you a little bit of the stuff that I have on slides and then show you there what the text blocks are about and how that works. And the string templates, sorry, not text blocks, you probably know those. And um, also the J package portion, which didn't fit in here. So I'm going to show you that now. That's a little bit less live coding than I in originally intentioned. But um, I think it's better to clean this out nicely than, uh, uh, than to haste a little bit more code. Okay, so what did we do? Um, first of all, what Java version was this? I just used JDK 23 <laughs> early access uh, with all the preview features. So if you're on 21, you cannot use all of this. The unnamed patterns, that was the underscore, uh, is finally in 22, unchanged. So, you know, if you want to use it in 21, it's kind of fine. String templates will probably be finalized um, almost unchanged compared to 21 in 23. And I don't know about structured task scope yet. It's also an early access feature. Uh, there is no JEP yet that proposes to finalize it in 23. Although I personally do expect that to happen, but we'll see. For the domain model, we used sealed interfaces and records to define exactly the data that we have. We used the sealed interfaces to define a minimal contract and alternatives, and we used the records to define the individual data points, basically, that we have. And we created this hierarchy, where blue are, in classic UML fashion, sealed interfaces, and orange are records. Um, note that this hierarchy is completely sealed. Like, there is no way that anybody can add code to this unless they change the permits clauses, add new types to this, unless they change the permits clauses. And that means the compiler can rely on that as well. If we have a page, we can rely that we have one of those four records, for example. This is the operation that again, you didn't get around to. For example, if you want to create a page name, the classical way to add operations in this data-oriented approach is to switch over one of these sealed interfaces and say, okay, if it's this type, I'm going to do this. If it's that type, I'm going to do that. Now, classically, in object-oriented programming, you want to add those operations to the interface, right? You want to not call page name that is a static method somewhere and takes apart your page. You want to have page name on the page interface. And in this specific example, that would be perfectly fine. But there are cases where you don't want to do this, where you already know that the operations and the types should not collide. In the past, you might have used the visitor pattern for that. So there, is already a situ there are already situations where we know we don't want to do this. And in those situations, um, this uh, kind of switch over state interfaces gives us the same affordances as the visitor pattern, the same compile time safety for adding operations and types, but it's just simpler and more direct. We used the HTTP client. That was pretty straightforward, I, I, I guess. Um, as I said, there's factory methods for or builders for the client and for the requests. And the, the resulting objects are then immutable and can be shared between threads. So that's pretty neat. We use structured concurrency. As I said, it's always three steps. First, you want to fork all the tasks. Then you want to wait for them to complete. And then you want to uh, get the results out. And only if you use a structured task scope will you get these owner IDs that uh, in some point in the future will allow you this navigation that I alluded to. We did not get around to using string templates. This would be one way to do that. So uh, my code highlighter here is at utterly failing. Uh, what I'm doing here is, I'm yes, I'm writing HTML as a Java string. Um, and then I'm embedding a variable. This backslash curly brace starts an expression, a Java expression. I'm calling pretty.pageName here. And all of that string, what I'm doing with that is, I'm passing it to what's called a template processor. And this template processor knows HTML. This one I wrote with JSOOP. It will make sure that this is actual legal HTML. It will make sure that the indentation is correct and all of that. And we'll create a nice looking string. This is what that would look like, where I uh, create um, here, this is my template processor, right? This is the interface I have to implement. Oop. And this is the, the in important method. I get a template, and now I need to return something. This call I return a JSOOP document. Now, very importantly, what I do here is a security problem. 
What I'm doing here is I'm telling the template, just interpolate yourself, put yourself together. And that means if this, if any of these strings that are embedded here contain HTML themselves, they will be parsed as HTML, right? This is an injection that I'm allowing here. I'm allowing a string that looks like HTML to be then interpreted as HTML. That is utterly unsafe if this were user-provided content. What the correct implementation would do is to go through the JSU process of iteratively parsing all of this and then escaping uh, the user content. But for that, you need to dig into the internals of JSUP. You should probably be working in, within JSUP uh, as one of the maintainers, uh, which I'm clearly not, so I didn't do this. So this is the quick and dirty part to interpolate stuff to a string and then parse it um, in a template. If you know that there's no user content or no user provided input, then it's better. But how do you make sure for the, about that in the future? That's not clear. So I would really recommend um, to use this for like local purposes or demo purposes. Uh, maybe you want to have a, a small experiment with this yourself. Uh, but don't put stuff like this in production that just treats user input as a markup language. Uh, the simple file server that I didn't get around to is pretty neat as well. You can just very, very easily start a file server programmatically in Java now. Um, if you don't want to do it programmatically, there's also a... Oh, that's kind of interesting. Let me see. Shouldn't there be... Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, you can use JWebServer, which is a binary, which also starts a simple web server, which is what I'm using here to show you these slides, because they are actually HTML and JavaScript. Okay. Then soon we get to the JPackage part. Even in the full version of this, uh, of this presentation, I could not show you JPackage because my Linux distribution does not support RPM or DEP, and so I don't have the tools installed to use JPackage. What JPackage allows you is to create doc, uh, operating system-specific installers that people can then use if you're still writing desktop applications. And this is what Jose did in this video. He's on Windows, so he create an .exe file here. Uh, with JPackage, you can see the command at the top there. It runs through a regular installer, uh, gives you, you know, like all the things you usually expect from a Windows installer. It's done now. He created in this video a second example where he provides file associations. So he's creating a Duke viewer that um, says everything that is a JPEG and has the extension .duke. I want to show that. And then that works fine, right? So now you see at the bottom left, you see that the Windows picked that up and used his, I his, his icon as the icon for the file. And you just click it double and then, uh, and then this opens. So that's JPEG for you. And that was that. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm anyway, we'll get back to that later. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit sorry that I had to cut it short. Uh, but if you go to the Java YouTube channel, you will see a t slightly longer version of this. But overall, you will also, and I think that's probably more important, take away from this, not exactly what I did, take away from this, oh, this is what these features look like. I'm kind of interested in to want to learn more about them. And if you go to uh, youtube.com slash Java, you will find a lot more there. You can also go to dev.java. Uh, to learn how these features work. And if you're interested to follow along how these features evolve and how new features arrive, check out inside.java, which is basically a link aggregator of everything interesting going on in OpenJDK. Not everything going on, because that's way too, way too much. That's the main reason why inside.java exists, to give you all the, uh, the important stuff. If any questions, I'll be here until lunch, as I said, and I'll see you around. Thank you.